This is Phil Leggett from Pusher. In this video, we're going to cover client events. Client events use the bi-directional communication power of WebSockets. This means that you bypass publishing events from your server and publish an event from the client to Pusher, which is then distributed to all other clients listening on that channel. If we look at the diagram on the home page of our docs, you'll see that um, we have your application server, Pusher, and browsers. Now, the standard way that we recommend people distribute events are by making a call to your server, and your server acts as the authority, checks that an event should be triggered, and then makes a call to Pusher. But obviously, we do support the bi-directional functionality of WebSockets, and you can send an event directly to Pusher from the browser or another client, any other client technology, and then Pusher will instantly distribute that to all other browsers, as I said, subscribed to the same channel, the channel that you're publishing the event on. One of the main reasons you might want to use client events is to reduce latency in terms of event distribution. Because in this case, instead of there being a call to your server, then a call to Pusher, then a call to any other listening clients, you can publish to Pusher and then straight to other browsers or other connected clients. And therefore, there's one less component for the message to be distributed through. So there's just Pusher and then other connected clients. Because we're aware of the security aspects of developing real-time web applications, you can only trigger client events on channels that have been authenticated. This means that you can only trigger client events on private or presence channels. We'll cover presence channels in a later video. So as we saw in the last video, the authentication mechanism gives your server an opportunity to say whether or not the current user and client has permission to subscribe to the channel. And therefore, if client events are enabled, whether they can trigger events on that channel too. As I just mentioned, client events need to be enabled for an application in order to be triggered. To do that, you need to go to the Pusher dashboard for your application. So if we go to app.pusherapp.com, and we've already logged in. I go to the real-time web workshop. If I go into settings, you'll see here I need to enable client events. So once that's enabled, it was already enabled, but I'll just do that anyway. Um, then you can send client events. If they're not enabled, you'll receive a message, an error message when you try and trigger a client event. So I'll, I'll disable them for now um, and we'll jump into the code into the real-time web workshop. We'll maximize that. So we're going in client events and we're going to start. So the first thing we'll do is we'll get this the config information that we need. I've got this from before somewhere. There we go. I'll save that. Um, we are using a private channel again. We've got our authentication in place from the previous video. So if we load our app, as I said, we're in, we're doing client events now and start. So do we connect? Yep, we're connected, no problem. Let's get another window open. Okay, so what should happen here is, if we look at the console, we've got a 403 because we're not authed. Again, the worst auth in the world. We'll just take that again, make sure we can log in the other side. Okay, there we go, hello from the left. Okay, we're good to go. So in order to trigger client events, we can, I can actually just cheat down here. I can access the instance that we've got running. If I take that, I, um, I get access to the channel. We 
which we know is called private message. Or oh, isn't called, it's private messages. Uh, and then we call trigger on it. Now trigger takes the name of the event you want to trigger. Hello. Um, now that's an invalid name actually to start off with. So we'll cover that in a minute, but I'll just demonstrate this. So here we've got um, unsupported event. Okay, so, so, so this error is actually because we're trying to trigger an event that doesn't have a client prefix. So the name of a client event needs to have a client hyphen prefix. Again, this is kind of a security aspect. It's so that when, it's really when you receive an event, a client event, you know when you're coding, you kind of go, all right, this is a client event. I can't necessarily trust this event because as you can see, I can type this code into the console. So any user of your application can potentially type this into a console and trigger events. So this time if I send it, um, it's not the same error. It's actually saying to send client events, you must enable this feature. So if we jump into our settings, we enable the feature. Cool. And then we jump in here again. And this time we try and trigger it. There we go, we've got a true over here. You'll also see on the right hand side, we've received a client event. So that has been sent. So we've actually seen how to send client events. So how do we want to use client events within our application? I don't actually want to use client events to send messages. I like to send messages in these sorts of applications via the server because it gives you an opportunity to check the user's logged in, to authenticate, to sanitize and validate the messages that are being sent. As I said earlier, client events are really good for applications where the latency keeps, needs to be kept to an absolute minimum, things such as games, but also they're good for adding extra value to applications. So in this case, um, I'd like to send information about when a user is typing or when a um, yeah or when text has been entered. So in order to display information like Phil is typing, we obviously need a username. So let's add the ability to have a username to the application. Um, what we'll do is in the same way as the authentication, we're just grabbing the information from the URL. We'll just use a get parameter. Again, if it was a normal application, you wouldn't do that. You'd have it stored in a session, um, potentially retrieving it from the database. So we'll, we'll have a username. Just go with the user. We'll make sure that that's applied. So if one hasn't been supplied, we'll default to creating one. And we'll give it a prefix of guest. We've now got a function that lets us retrieve a username. Um, we want to make that available to JavaScript because we're triggering from the client. So what we'll do is we'll include our functions file. And we'll also create a user variable here. And we'll have a name property, which we fetch from PHP. So obviously when this um, index.php is rendered, we'll call the get username function. Okay, that's good. So if we now reload the page, it looks like we've got an error. I should really turn error reporting on, but I can see that I've uh, included function.php rather than functions. I know that because I do that quite a lot. Um, so if I now reload that, okay, we are loading, we're subscribing. Let's make sure that there's a user object and it has a value of guest. Now, if I add a user, Fill, reload the page. 
type in user. Okay, so we now have a a username available to the client. So we can now start triggering events when the user types. So if we jump into our JavaScript and we've got the jQuery callback here. What we want to do is we want to bind to the key up event. Uh, we'll call a user typing. Let's find out the ID of the element that we want to bind to. So yeah, we've got user message here. So whenever the key up occurs there, we've got user typing function. We can use it typing and let's just log for now. Let's see how that works out. Okay, so we can see that that's being called. Now, if you think about it, if we send a client event every time the user presses it or the key comes up, then that could be a lot of client events being triggered. Now, we restrict client events to 10 per second um, for a client. We believe that 10 is enough. Um, we have the, the ability to, to increase that for certain um, customers if required. But in this case, we obviously only really want to send when the user starts typing, when the user stops typing. So what we need to do is in the code, we now know when the user's typing. So what we want to do is the user presses a key. We send an event to say the user's typing. If the user presses a key again, we don't want to send another event. So we need something to say the user is still typing. We also want to go the user stop typing. So if the user hasn't press the key for a number of seconds, then we want to trigger an event to say the user hasn't, isn't typing anymore. So what we'll do is we'll use a timeout. We'll have a typing timeout. And so if the timeout isn't in operation, we can then trigger an event which is client typing saying typing true and we'll also send the username to say who's typing which we know is user dot name Okay, so we haven't triggered the timeout yet. So we've also got, obviously got an else. The, the user is still typing. Then we want to clear the timeout because the user is still typing. And we'll also do typing timeout equals null. And then obviously we really do need the window.set timeout. And in there, what we want to do is, if this is triggered, it means the user isn't typing anymore. We'll do, say, three seconds. We'll do channel. Trigger client typing. Um, it's obviously the same user. We'll do typing true. Uh, sorry, false because the user isn't typing. Okay, and then we also want to null down that typing timeout because we check it above. Okay, so let's jump into here. Reload the page to get the new script. 
So we can see down there, we're getting client typing, uh, typing equals true. We waited for three seconds. We had typing, it's now false. So over here, you'll see where we received the messages. Um, the next thing to do is obviously display that information. So we want somewhere to display some activity. So we'll add that just under here. Now you could obviously have multiple users typing, but for the moment, we'll just have uh, this activity element. So we've seen triggering the events. The next thing is we want to, to see handling those client events. So we know it's typing. Um, we'll, we'll handle the typing. Now you could do this in line. Again, I like to do it so they're, they're available. You can potentially write some functions. You could expose that function and, and test them. Some data. Now what we want to do is update that activity to say Typing. So data dot typing. Now the obvious problem here is that I'm I'm assuming there's just one user. You'd probably have a lookup of usernames to say who's typing, who isn't. But for the moment, I'm just going to I'm just going to clear it. Um, we'll look at changing that a bit later. So let's refresh on both sides so they both get updated. Well, I guess I'm Phil. So you'll say Phil is typing there. We're getting the event there when I stop typing and it disappears. Um, this user will make this user to write oh, that needs to be user so mr. Wright is typing okay so we've so we've got this user is typing functionality um, so there's other things you can do here um, I'm, I'm not going to demonstrate doing everything but the other things you can do is you could send information about um, the user has entered text. So when they stop typing, you can check whether there's a value and send, send yes, the user has entered text, but they're no longer typing. Um, you also could, could do things about lookups for users that are, are present and, uh, and whether they're typing or not. So in the next video, we're going to use presence. Um, presence provides a way of knowing who is subscribed, so who is online. And that's obviously really useful in kind of chat scenarios or in... Um, social applications where you want to know which of your friends are online. So that's the video covering client events. Client events are good for really low latency messaging between clients. Um, there's obviously a security aspect to think about. Can you trust the the event that's been sent to you? Um, the client events have, an, have a client hyphen prefix, which means that when you receive them in your code, you're aware you need to make sure that the data is allowable and that you're going to actually use it within your application because that information, especially from JavaScript, someone can open a JavaScript console and trigger it. So I hope that was useful. And in the next video, we'll cover user presence using presence channels.